in the last module we had been looking at the problem of volatility. Volatility is primarily a situation where we have variance non-stationarity. We have seen how we can model volatility. It can be done through exogenous variables. It can be done through a bilinear model. But the most preferred method of modeling volatility is through the arts or the guards model. These are the autoregressive, conditional heteroscedasticity and the general autoregressive, conditional heteroscedastic models respectively. This arts models came into vogue in 1982 through a paper by Engel, which was later extended by Boleslev in 1986 as the Gartz model. What we will be doing today is to look in detail at the arts model. The properties of the arts model, in particularly the properties of the arts one model. And we'll also look at how we can estimate the parameters of the arts model. Let us look at the arch p model in general. So, we have the model like x t the process is equal to epsilon t into sigma t. We will call this the first equation. Here sigma t square is given by alpha naught plus alpha 1 x t minus 1 square plus etcetera up to alpha p x t minus t square. We will call this the second equation where epsilon t in this case is a sequence of iid random variables with mean 0 and in this case we will assume the variance to be equal to 1. It is a constant, so we can without loss of generality assume it to be 1. For the time being let us assume alpha naught is greater than 0 and all the alpha j's are greater than or equal to 0. Now the condition that the alpha naught and the alpha j's are positive is required because sigma t square actually turns out to be the variance. So, to ensure that in 2 the variance does on the left hand side does not become negative, we need to have the alphas positive. Remember that all the x's are squared values. So, whatever the sign of the x's, the values would come out to be positive. So, this condition on the parameters is required to ensure the positivity or non-negativity of the variance. Generally, we assume that epsilon t is normal 0 1, but we will see that we can change this assumption as well. Some of the observations that we have, firstly, if you have large past observations, then this leads to a larger variance at the current point, but is not confined to p periods only. So, what does it mean? It means that the current values of x t would be or its variance would be large because sigma t square depends on x t minus 1, x t minus 2, etcetera. Hence, large values in the past that is x t minus 1, x t minus 2 would make the sigma square t value large. The other point is that the model assumes that the positive and negative shocks have the same effect. So, if you have a large positive shock that is if x t minus 1 is large positively, then it becomes x t minus 1 square. So, the sign actually does not matter. So, even if you had an equally large negative shock that is x t minus 1, in that case also the value would have been squared and the effect would have been the same. So, this model assumes that the positive and negative shocks have the same effect. Very often this is taken as a defect of the model because in certain cases the positive shocks and the negative shocks have different impacts on the variability. We will see that later. Now, the process generates data with fatter tails than that of the normal density. Often the t distribution gives a better fit. 
So, as we mentioned and as we will see later that the distribution generally would be leptocartic. So, the underlying process distribution is not mesocartic and hence the normal assumption may not always be applicable in this case. And T being a leptocartic distribution, T very often gives a better fit. Let us look in more detail at the arch 1 model, that is when we take P equal to 1 in the arch P model. So, the arch 1 model has the same first equation that is x t is epsilon t into sigma t with sigma t square now equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 x t minus 1 square. So, there is just one previous step that we go back to when we model sigma t square. Epsilon t is our i i d with expectation epsilon t equal to 0 and variance of epsilon t equal to 1 as before. Now, if alpha 1 is equal to 0, the process reduces to a Gaussian white noise because the x t minus 1 term does not come into sigma t square and hence the process reduces to a Gaussian white noise. If alpha 1 is greater than 0, then successive observations will be dependent through higher order moments and if too large, the variance can be infinite at times. So, it will depend on what the x t minus 1 values are. And since it is squared, so the positive it is only going to be positive and it very often blows up the variance. Let us look at some of the other properties, but before that let us define by f t the present and past values of x. So, f t is the set of values of x t, x t minus 1, x t minus 2 to all the remote and the recent past values. Thus, conditionally what we get is expectation of x t given f t would be equal to 0, because the past values are given and hence the expectation would depend on epsilon t, which is 0 mean and hence expectation of x t is going to be 0. What about the variance? the variance depends on the past value of x t minus 1 and since it is given variance comes out to be sigma t square which is alpha naught plus alpha 1 x t minus 1 square. Unconditionally the mean obviously would again be 0, but what about the variance? The variance in this case would be expectation of the variance of x t given f t, because the conditional variance expectation is 0. So, the other term would not come in and we have expectation of alpha naught plus alpha 1 x t minus 1 square. And if we simplify this slightly assuming that the process is stationary, then we have variance of x t equal to variance of x t minus 1, which is expectation of x t square, because the mean is 0. We have variance of x t is alpha naught plus alpha 1 variance of x t. Remember the right hand side at t minus 1, but they have the same variances under stationarity and we can write this. This would imply if we solve for variance x t from here, this would give us variance of x t is alpha naught by 1 minus alpha 1. Now, because the variance must be non-negative, we need to have alpha 1 between 0 and 1. So, this is a restriction that we must impose on the alpha 1 parameter. It cannot be indefinitely large. It, it needs to be positive as we saw because of it is a it leads to the variance, but again it cannot be positively any value, it has to be between 0 and 1. One other thing that we should note here is that when we look at the variance, the conditional variance was a function of x t minus 1 square. However, the unconditional variance is independent of time. So, that is the reason we call this a autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic model, 
conditionally it is heteroscedastic, unconditionally it has the same variance. Let us look at the kurtosis of this model. Now, since the epsilon t's are normal and this is what is important, we assume normality here. Expect the fourth moment expectation x t to the power of 4 given f t minus 1 would be thrice the square of the third moment and hence it will be thrice alpha naught plus alpha 1 x t minus 1 square whole square. Now, if x t is the fourth order stationary with m 4 equal to expectation of x t to the power of 4 that is all fourth order moments are independent of the time then what we have is expectation of x t to the power of 4 unconditionally would be expectation of what we had as the conditional expectation and this translates to thrice the expectation of alpha naught plus alpha 1 x t minus 1 square whole square. And on simplification this gives us the following expression m 4 is equal to thrice alpha naught square plus alpha 1 square m 4 plus twice alpha naught into alpha 1 into variance of x t. And if we solve using the expression for va variance of x t that we have already got, we get m 4 as 3 times alpha naught square into 1 plus alpha 1 by 1 minus alpha 1 into 1 minus thrice alpha 1 square. So, that is the fourth moment of the process and hence we can get the kurtosis, the unconditional kurtosis would be the fourth moment divided by the square of the second moment and this simplifies to 3 1 minus alpha 1 square by 1 minus thrice alpha 1 square. Now, if you look at the numerator and the denominator, since we are subtracting only alpha 1 square from the numerator and thrice alpha 1 square from the denominator subtracting both from 1, the denominator is going to be smaller than the numerator and hence this ratio is going to be greater than 1. So, the fourth moment or in this case the kurtosis would be greater than 3. So, we can say that the underlying process would be leptocartic. So, we assume x t is leptocartic. Now, also we must have the condition alpha 1 square is less than 1 third because this comes from the value of kappa being positive. The m fourth moment is a even moment and hence it has to be a positive value and hence this restriction on alpha 1 square. So, there is a further restriction that we have on alpha 1. Some alternative forms of the arch 1 model, one such form is that sigma t square instead of being a linear function of x t minus 1 square is e to the power of alpha naught plus alpha 1 x t minus 1 square. In this case the variance is positive for any value of alpha naught and alpha 1. So, you need not put in any restrictions in this case. And for any alpha 1 not equal to 0, the variance is infinite that is one problem that crops up here. So, the advantage is unlike previously we do not have to restrict alpha naught alpha 1 to be non-negative, but if alpha 1 is non-zero then the variance tends to infinity. Another alternative is take a linear function, but instead of the square of x t minus 1, take the mod value of x t minus 1. And in this case, both alpha naught and alpha 1 must be positive. So, the same restriction applies here. It is just that instead of the square, you are taking the modulus and getting rid of the sign of x t minus 1. But again, like before this has a finite variance. So, unlike the previous model, this does not have an infinite variable. It is it more or less is similar to the arch model as we have defined it before. How do we estimate the arch parameters? Assuming normality first of all. So, we have the parameters as alpha which is alpha naught to alpha p and given that x t 
is normal conditionally with mean 0 and variance sigma t square. The conditional likelihood can be written as L is product over t equal to 1 to n and the normal PDF 1 by twice pi to the power of half sigma t e to the power of minus x t square by twice sigma t square. So, notice that unlike other models in this case sigma is not a constant it is a function of t and the conditional log likelihood is capital L is constant plus summation t equal to 1 to n minus half log sigma t square minus x t square by twice sigma t square. And then this is not so easy to solve and hence we take recourse to the Newton Raphson method. We have the score vector u alpha as delta L delta alpha and this comes out as a sum where we first differentiate with respect to sigma t square and then differentiate sigma t square with respect to alpha and the expression is what we get here. So, you see if you look at the model at the likelihood as we had written it, it did not seem to have alpha in it, but the alpha was actually embedded in the sigma t's. So, when we actually do the derivative do it in two steps, first take the derivative with respect to sigma t square the derivative of L and then the derivative of sigma t square with respect to alpha. Similarly, if we are looking at the second moment or second derivative in this case, you can take the derivative of u alpha with alpha prime and you get an expression like this. And the second term comes out to be 0. So, the Fisher information matrix while taking expectation of the negative of the second derivative comes out to be summation t equal to 1 to n 1 by twice sigma t to the power of 4 and then you have delta sigma t square delta alpha delta sigma t square delta alpha prime and then you iterate till convergence with alpha hat at the mth step given by alpha hat at the mth step and then iterate by taking alpha hat m plus 1 that is the m -th step m plus 1 -th step estimate as alpha hat m that is the m -th step estimate plus i inverse alpha hat m into u alpha hat m and this gives us the you continue this till you get a convergence and you get the alpha hat value. However, because x t is leptokartic the assumption of normality is not always valid particularly for small samples. In such cases we prefer the t distribution with new degrees of freedom and uh, this is a leptokartic distribution and hence generally gives a better fit. So, let us have a very quick look at the t distribution. The conditional likelihood for new greater than 2 is given by this expression here which is a little bit complicated much complicated than the normal distribution and then we can write the conditional log likelihood given new known as this. We will see later that what happens when new is unknown for the timing we are assuming new is known and take it to be a constant. So, the first part of small l actually goes into the constant where you have which is a primarily a function of mu and you are just writing this as a function of sigma t square and the alphas come in through the sigma t square. And then as for the normal distribution you can take the first derivative and construct the score vector and take the second derivative and the expectation of the negative of the second derivative would give you the information matrix and then you can work on it to get a solution through iteration. So, until convergence you can always do this. So, this is how we actually estimate the parameters of the ART model. In today's module we introduced the ARCH P model. We then looked in detail at the ARCH 1 model, the different properties of the ARCH model, particularly that of 
left characteristics. An arch one model in or in general an arch p model is left -carted. And this makes it different in its analysis from the general time series processes because when you have a leptocartic model you have a fat tail and you need to take account of this. We also saw how we can estimate the parameters of the arch model. In the subsequent lecture we will be looking at how to build a arch model, estimate its parameters and look at its properties when given a general time series.